This is the Mondo Wise Podcast. I'm Dave Reed. Last month, Frank Barat spoke with Nora Ericott on our new YouTube show, Witnessing Palestine. As we recorded that program, Gaza had been under Israeli bombardment from the air, land, and sea for 70 days. At that time, 18,000 Palestinians in Gaza were known to have been killed by the Israeli military. Today, that number is over 28,000. More than 68,000 Palestinians in Gaza have been wounded. The Israeli military continues to invade Palestinian cities and villages in the West Bank. Violent attacks on Palestinians by Israeli settlers also continue. Nora joined Frank to discuss the collective trauma of Israel's genocidal assault on Gaza and where the global movement for Palestinian freedom goes from here. Nora is a human rights attorney and an associate professor at Rutgers University in the Department of Africana Studies and the Program in Criminal Justice. She is an editorial committee member of the Journal for Palestine Studies and a co-founding editor of Jadalia. I've been wanting to talk to you for a few weeks. You know, you know that we've been in touch on WhatsApp and stuff. And to obviously we're not like a news media. I'm not a news media. I want to talk to you more about what do we do as people, as activists, as human beings when we faced with, in a way, mm. collective trauma, grief and anger, you know, how do we not crumble? You said recently, I think to a group of students, we wake up and we're not sure what today is going to be like. And that's why a lot of us have been feeling in the last few weeks, you don't even want to switch on the news because you're worried another hospital would have been bombed, another seven kids would have been dead, killed. So how do we keep going as human beings in front of such collective trauma and grief? Yeah, that's a wonderful, it's a wonderful way to open and a very, I think, vulnerable way to open. In my reference, every night I sleep in the same way or I attempt to sleep in the same way, which is deep, deep prayer, right? The willing and the faith that in the morning there will be a ceasefire, my time, right? And I have turned in this moment as a very secular human, <laughs> I've turned to lots of prayer to be able to fill the gaps of this grief and to be able to fill the gaps in the ineptitude of leadership and the institutions that should have made this moment impossible, unfathomable. And when I wake up in the morning and do not find that there is a ceasefire, oftentimes there's a mix, right? I'm always going to turn on the news. It's not the trepidation to do that, but really the feeling is inside of me. My spirit has fluctuated and has not been the same, you know? You know, and I think a lot of Palestinians have answered the question when people ask them, how are they? You know, I've answered that question to other Palestinians as I'm exactly like you. And I've answered the question to, you know, almost everyone else by explaining every day is different. Today I am and fill in the blank. And so on some days, like the day before yesterday, I had an unprecedented feeling of energy and fight. It was a wonderful feeling. I haven't had that feeling probably in those 68 days that preceded it. And I wanted to hold on to it thinking maybe this would last. I had the energy to pick up all the phone calls and to run and to multitask and to do the interview and jump on to the email and then take the emergency phone call. And then yesterday, I didn't feel like that. <laughs> yesterday, I was devastated. And I was strung together by a, a panic attack. Just I was on the edge of a panic attack all day so that I didn't even have the patience to be as kind as I would like to in my interactions and responses. Because every request just felt like the end of me. Because what if I could not respond adequately? And today is yet to be seen. I've started already and taken the phone calls and responded to the crises and tried to write. But, you know, there's a way in which I haven't figured out yet yeah, this is going to be good or bad. How is it that we get by? My instinct tells me, and I'm going to, I imagine this is how other people feel that I've spoken to. My instinct every day tells me to hide. And I have hidden for a long time. I've self-isolated, you know, people who want to hang out. I'm almost annoyed. I'm like, to do what? unless you want to watch the news together mm. or to work together, you know what I mean? And my instinct is to retreat. And yet it's precisely in fighting that instinct 
in which I've developed the energy and cultivated in order to continue. It's precisely when I've agreed, you know, to come out into a home where friends have gathered in collective prayer and grief that I felt better. It's precisely when I see other people who are also holding grief so that we can hold it together that I feel better. It's precisely when I've gone to the poetry reading for Palestine, where when I walked into the room, I hid all the way in the back because I couldn't stomach looking at anybody in the eye. That by the end of that reading, I felt that the words and the collective energy in that room massaged a spiritual knot that gave me enough energy to go on for maybe two more days. So, yeah, I think, Frank, my advice is, you know, generically we tell people we're all we got, we have to survive. And yet in these moments of extreme, extenuating, grotesque circumstances, the hardest thing to do is to be with one another and to expand our capacity for, you know, that collective moment as opposed to working for another five hours incessantly on something that I have found that that's given me enough energy to go on maybe two to three days, if I'm lucky, five days before that spiritual resolve dissolves once again. In a way, like, do you try to hold on to the beauty? I don't know if you know what I mean, but that's what I've, I mean, what we're experiencing is horrible. I've never experienced anything like this in my life. You know, I've followed Palestine for 15, 20 years, and there's a moment of a breakdown. I feel I've been, in a way, on the verge of tears for about eight weeks now. It's always fighting. You know, what do you keep above or do you stay above or do you go down, you know? But, I mean, I live in Brussels. I've met over the last eight weeks 200 people I didn't know eight weeks ago, people from all walks of life that have stopped mm. everything. And I think if we don't hold to this beauty, we crumble. But do you know what I mean? No, absolutely. Listen, one, I want to point out two things in what you said. Number two, and you said you've never experienced this. I just want to emphasize this is a collective human catastrophe. Yes, it hits far deeper for Palestinians who are literally being subject to a genocide and whose very existence, which was, you know, always expressed by the right wing as the existential threat, as the threat to the world, as the problem that needed to be solved, is now on the top level of the agenda across mainstream media, government, and even university administrations, right? But this is a human experience. One, you know, you described 200 people that have stopped everything. It does remind me of the moment, you know, that the same way that in its international nature, the pandemic of COVID made us all experience the same thing. Palestine is actually sustaining a collective global experience for us in an unprecedented way in this moment. And it's heightened by the fact that technological advancements make it such that we are literally witnessing the grotesque nature, not just the metaphorical, the hypothetical, right? But the literal grotesque nature of genocidal violence and the colonial order that sustains it. So yeah, in these moments, the beauty is in the promise and the result, right? The beauty for me, I've seen many, many times. It was, I forget her name and I, if she sees this, forgive me. I apologize to you if you're watching this. The NYU law student who single-handedly made the entire administration tremble and then refused to back down. She was so filled with this sense of truth. She's not Palestinian. She was so imbued with this sense of truth nonetheless and the threats that came with it and the, you know, national attacks that she came on to democracy now and held strong. Wow. Mm -hmm. What beauty did I see in that humanity and what humans are capable of? What beauty in the incessant and brave and unprecedented offering of Palestinian journalists, like Wa'el Dahdouh, whose wife and children were killed and who stood in front of the camera to continue 
in that duty? What strength there? Or from Mu'taz and Bisan and Saleh and Plastia, who frankly are, you know, just above being children. They barely cross the threshold of childhood. They're in their 20s. What are other people doing in their 20s? Right? And yet, in that moment, right, Plastia finds, you know, is gifted a turtle from an elder woman who gives it to her and she rejoices in that turtle. In that moment, she plays Uno with a number of Palestinian children sipping tea in a tent. And it's that, you know, our commitment to fighting is first and foremost a commitment to life. And to witness that commitment in that way is very beautiful, is precisely what sustains us and what has made us evolve, I hope, for the better as humanity or parts of humanity. I mean, we will get into that. I think that humanity is a false construct at this point. Yeah. Um, but, you know, in those things that so many of us consider as the most essential things that make us alive. Yeah. Thanks, Nura. I, I mentioned, like, when I started, like, the journey, the path that we are all embarked on. You know, all the people, all the people with a capital P have experienced genocide, have experienced ethnic cleansing before. Exactly. I was wondering, what do you see as the most useful lessons from indigenous thinkers and indigenous movements at this time? Thank you. So I want to lift up that in addition to indigenous peoples who have endured many stages of genocide, right? An apocalypse, mm. right? This world shattering. Like we can talk about the loss of life. But there's a loss of life in which, you know, you have a world to continue in. And then there's a loss of life, as in this moment, where nothing, right, around you, your world is shattered. Your streets, your homes, your schools, your places of worship, your community gatherings, corners that mark memories, right? Even relationships with one another that have been shattered. That this is apocalyptic in that sense. And beyond indigenous peoples who have endured this apocalypse, Palestinians endured it at least twice in 48 and 67, right? You know, some might say even in 82 after the invasion of Lebanon, but the apocalypse of African descendant peoples who have been kidnapped and enslaved, their lives ripped apart repeatedly every single day in the prevention of even being able to sustain family as families were turned into isolated, alienable property yeah. and Jewish life. And the apocalypse that was experienced in the Holocaust, also a memory of apocalypse that has animated you know, the descendants of those Jews in, in particular in many different directions. Some have been animated in order to make sure it never happens again because they know it and others have been animated to make sure it doesn't happen again to them even if the rest of the world, as they know it, becomes more dangerous. So what do we learn from indigenous scholars? I mean, which ones hmm. and how? I have particularly lifted up and mentioned... Audra Simpson, Nick Estes, who is a dear friend, Maya McDashi, Irena Barakat is an indigenous, Palestinian indigenous scholar. Maya is a Lebanese, Ojibwe indigenous scholar. I want to lift up Glenn Coltard, who has taught me much. And just in those limited readings, what we get is a few things. And one is an insistence that we live on a continuum of settler time that renders an indigenous peoples to a past, right? To some past that we can never go back to and almost freezes indigenous people, not only to the past, but also, you know, freezes them in a moment of time that then counts against them if they evolve as communities. You're not as indigenous. Yeah if you're not necessarily on the land or you've evolved in different ways. So one is a rejection of settler time. But that indigenous time continues that disrupts that, right? Another is the concept that Nurjud as a Palestinian 
indigenous scholar gives us in her study of Hawaii and Palestine of geography of place. So many of the places that we know are also settler places, settler geography that very thinly veils indigenous knowledge, right? Right before it, around it, on it, we're on it. Another is the concept of indigenous sovereignty, that the concept of sovereignty that we have learned, you know, very traditionally, especially enshrined in international law, is a concept of sovereignty that ties self-governance and self-determination to territory and statehood. Whereas, right, Audra Simpson reminds us that there are these concepts of nested sovereignty. We're like the Mohawk nation that straddles a settler border between the United States and Canada. They actually are their settler sovereignty within their bodies as they travel with it, as they sustain it together. Another concept is a refusal, a politics of refusal and a demand for non-recognition, like Glenn Coulthard, who has shown us that recognition by the settler sovereign is actually a trap. Mm. That U.S. recognition of indigenous nations, and this echoes the work of Edom Katachu and John Reynolds, you know, of repressive inclusion, that inclusion in these frameworks, in these settler frameworks, doesn't necessarily make us stronger, right? And the PLO has fallen into that trap but that the inclusion of these frameworks actually just traps us in somebody else's concept of life. The last one that I'll share is Indigenous Resurgence. Indigenous Resurgence, and this is the work of John Corntassel, who points out that similar to this idea of nested sovereignty, that resurgence in one's community when we turn away from the settler sovereign and actually work on our own community, that we are doing the work of decolonization because we are building for the life after, Mm. right? We are building for the life, you know, we are planting the seeds and from these seeds grows the life that we want rather than just continuously focusing on our settler sovereign, the colonial domination that we want to remove. Lessons are abundant, and I encourage those, all of us, I encourage all of us, especially those who live as settlers, as I do, on stolen lands, to not fetishize Indigenous histories and struggles and communities, but to engage with them in a way that reflects an ethical solidarity in moving forward. Because the struggle for Palestine is a struggle for all Indigenous peoples. The struggle for Palestine is a struggle against all colonization and against all racial domination. And that has to be true everywhere and not just in one place. I'm glad you actually mentioned a common friend, John Reynolds, because he's the one I spoke to him today and he said, ask Noura about indigenous lessons and stuff. So that was his question. Yeah, that was, Thanks, that John. was his question. You know, John and I, and, you know, John is Irish. And I always joke that when we went to Dublin to share the book talk was the first time I was in Europe and I didn't feel like I was in white society, (laughs) interestingly. I mean, I think Irish identity and whiteness shifts, Mm -hmm. right, from the United States and in Ireland. So it's, you know, and it also reflects race as a construct, as a social construction. But the other thing about John is he and I have been working on a book project together the provisional title of which was Confronting Zionism, Dismantling the Apartheid of Our Time, taking on the reticence of those who described Israel as overseeing an apartheid regime from actually grappling with the Zionist ideology that actually drives, Mm -hmm. right? Genocidal expansion and territorial consolidation. And so, you know, we've been thinking about this for quite some time. And now we're in a moment where, you know, we've been going back, what happens now with this project? Because the terms have shifted so fast, so radically in such revolutionary ways, right? That even though the discussion of racism and racial colonialism more specifically, which is apartheid, apartheid is a racial colonial structure. You know, it's been domesticated in international law as a concept, but it is a racial colonial structure. It's global in its dimension. Even though genocide would not have been possible without the thorough dehumanization that that racial colonialism actually facilitated, right? How? How could you have possibly embarked on this genocidal campaign if there wasn't already a priming 
that Palestinians didn't deserve to live or somehow that if they do, it's a privilege yeah. and that they have to somehow sign a contract of being good natives in order to live. I mean, that's literally what they have been told, which makes this moment possible. And yet, you know, this moment makes it, does that conversation almost feel too far away now? Yeah. So just something that we've been thinking about. Sounds great. <laughs> I mean, John and yourself, and I'm going to move to a more, because I know you're in high demand. I don't want to keep you for four hours because we could actually talk for about four hours. And we have, haven't we, Frank? <laughs> in Belgium. Yes. John and yourself also are legal scholars. And I wanted to ask you something because what's been happening forever with Palestine from Operation Cat in 2009 until now is people looking at legal institutions, the ICJ, the ICC, domestic courts, to actually, in a way, break the impunity of Israel, Israeli generals and politicians. But you've recently also said that institutions, including legal institutions, have been structures in our domination, talking about the domination of the Palestinian people. What do you mean by that? Yeah, no, I think it's really confusing because I'm trained as a human rights attorney. That's my experience before I entered the academy. It continues to be the subject of a big part of my own research. And so I think it's very confusing to general audiences who look to me like, you're a lawyer and you have a hammer. Go find a nail. <laughs> You know, this is George Bisharat, who actually is a mentor and taught me at one point. And his reprieve that lawyers are given hammers and so they look for nails everywhere. And yet one of the things that I've learned in my own work and my own experience and research is that the law works against us. Right. And I say in my book, law is power. Mm. Law is power. And to the extent that it could be used in the service of emancipatory struggles, it has to be done so on behalf of very strategic political campaigns, not the other way around, right? Because if law is power, then our primary concern needs to be power. How do we grow it? What do we make of it? And in that context, we can use the law merely as a tactic but not as a strategy. And so I think that, and I trace this history for 100 years between 1917 and 2017, and in fact show that Israel has used international law far more to its advantage than Palestinians have. Obviously, this is a reflection of power as well, but it's also a reflection of that strategic appreciation. In this moment, we're seeing something very similar where there is this mobilization to use, especially amongst the legal professionals for whom I have a tremendous amount of respect, notwithstanding this possible strategic disagreement, you know, to find all the small legal mechanisms in which to enter at the UN and beyond the da -da 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 -da, the petitions and so on and so forth. And my thought has been since 2014, at least when Palestine began to discuss its accession to the Rome Statute that would have made it a member of the ICC, of which now it is, and it's recognized, that we should never believe that these institutions are going to work in our favor, right? That these very institutions, by their nature, even looking at the document that established the ICC, the 1998 Rome Statute, in the words of scholar Kamari Maxine Clark, enshrines white supremacy of the core crimes that can be prosecuted. Colonialism is not one of them. The fact that there's a temporal limit on what can be prosecuted means that all colonial atrocities are beyond actual prosecution. The fact that there's a complementarity clause which stipulates that the first right of jurisdiction goes to a national court before it becomes the ICC's jurisdiction means that the most advanced states will probably never have to appear in the court if they have the means and the will to prosecute themselves. I can go on and on, but we know this from the text. And now we know this from experience that since the ICC has been established, it's only indicted Arab and African heads of state and accused, you know, with the exception of Slomodon Milosevic and now the arrest warrant for Vladimir Putin. So knowing this, 
how is it? And I was part of a team that actually filed an ICC petition. So that's really a contradiction, right? But how is it that we appreciate this possibility and still use these tools? Well, the way that I use this with my team is to agitate. We use that as an entry point in order to create the controversy that now needed to be addressed. Now it became a top line media question. Now we can actually make, and we could before without the petition, but the petition certainly helped. But that gave us the platform and the opportunity to make our charges yeah. and to call for arrest warrants even before we appear in court, which is probably not going to happen anytime soon. Kareem Khan, the prosecutor, has already visited Israeli families who are survivors of the October 7th operation, the attacks, and already concluded that likely Hamas committed war crimes. And yet it took six years between 2015 and 2021 for the ICC to decide that Palestine does have jurisdiction after it acceded. And it, the investigation has been open for two years since 2021. And Khan has not spoken to any Palestinians in Gaza, despite the fact that this is not the first large-scale offensive onslaught that they've been subjected to. And consider that just earlier this year, in February, 35 Palestinian human rights organizations approached Khan because the beginning of this year, as you remember, Frank, was promised to be the deadliest year in Palestinian history since 2005. And so approach the prosecutor with that appeal in February. And yet here we are in the midst of genocide with this legacy. And where is Kareem Khan? So one way to see that is to be horribly disappointed and to give up, right? We've done everything we can. We've mobilized. We've held marches in the millions. We've sustained this charge of genocide. And yet here we are. One way to respond to that is to just give up. That's really disheartening. And it occurred to me, and this is why I shared what you're sharing there, that I wanted to remind folks that we actually won. We actually have already achieved what this genocide convention enabled us to do, which is to name this atrocity. In Guernica, the city has already blared the siren warning of genocide. Every time there's a march chanting ceasefire now and free Palestine, that is a siren of genocide. And that we should not take the collusion of these international legal institutions, which sustain white supremacy and the supremacy of a Western colonial order as somehow a mark of our failure, but actually just as part of the struggle. And that's how we need to continue to be strategic against them. To win, to actually win in this demonstrating genocide outside of the courtroom, because genocide was committed and genocide was immoral even before it was proscribed in the 1948 in the Genocide Convention. Does the absence of a convention mean it didn't happen? Does the absence of a ruling mean it didn't happen? Of course not. Of course not. So do not put our faith in those institutions that are not there to protect us in the first place. And to the extent that we use those institutions, we need to do so with a healthy dose of skepticism and very strategically and how we're going to move all with the intent of building power, which is why, Frank, one of the things you and I worked on was very useful in this regard. You spearheaded, right? You organized the Russell Tribunal on Palestine in four different locations that found that the U.S. was a pillar in Israel's apartheid, prolonged occupation, the usurpation of self-determination, the violation of these preemptory norms. You were part, you know, the one in South Africa that found that Israel practiced apartheid in 2013 right? Years before yeah. the international human rights legacy organizations caught up to it. And frankly, years after, decades after, Palestinian intellectuals and organizers and activists and revolutionaries and fighters had demonstrated the same thing. So we continue that legacy. Last question, Noura. You've partly responded 
I remember, again, I go back to Operation Cat Slade because on a personal level, it felt like a a moment that will change everything. You know, I remember talking to activists and legal scholars, and, you know, this moment is going to change everything. Israel's gone too far. Israel shot itself in the foot. But then we went back to normal in a way, right? And then there was another one mm. in 2012 and in 2014 and in the massacres in Gaza, like, you know, there's so many of them. So I don't know how you feel, but I feel like this one, I just feel it inside. I feel it in my body, in my vein, that this one, that changes everything. Something's changed. The fact that we can talk about genocide. I mean, the Russell Tribunal was in New York. We wanted to address genocide. But then a lot of people said, no, we can't talk about genocide. Let's talk about sociocide. But now we talk about genocide Remember openly. That. You know. So in a way, my question is, does this moment change everything? Or how do we make sure it does change everything? I think the latter question is actually the most apt one. Here's the thing. I agree with you. It certainly changes everything. The question is, how do we define time and change, right? Is it an immediate change or not? And so, yeah, in my estimation, unfortunately, what we're seeing, we're about to see something much worse. In Palestine, as we see against the Palestinian citizens of the state, who can't even like posts. Mm. They can't even like posts on social media without being fired or arrested. Or the Palestinians in East Jerusalem who are now being subject to cleansing, where the settlers are being armed and transformed to an explicit paramilitary unit. Or in Gaza, where Israel is planting flags along the shore of Palestinian cities. Or in the United States or across European geographies where structures of repression are actually now just taking shape that are criminalizing intifada from the river to the sea. Free Palestine. There was a podcast that literally tried to liken free Palestine to hail Hitler. My God. For us, this is so absurd, but it's also the beginning, I think, of a much worse moment to come in terms of our repression. And so we need to prepare for that and not to be disheartened by that either. But that tightening that I think is on the horizon, that violence, that crude coercive force that's on the horizon, that's far more crude even than what we've seen, is an indication of the absolute failure of the moral authority of Zionism, that if there was an argument to be made that now it lacks moral authority that can sustain it, and instead it's outright coercive force to the point where Zionists in the United States who are a minority and have the most to lose through clamping down on free speech are advocating for clamping down on free speech, right? They are working against their own interests. They are strengthening a police state that will not just attack Black, Brown, and Indigenous peoples, but that will attack everybody. And so those of us who are paying attention know that, the critical amongst us know that, the people who are not speaking are not speaking precisely because they know that. And they're afraid of this repression. But what it also indicates is that there is a common understanding that there is a lid being placed on. And a lid placed on that much pressure cannot be maintained. Impossible. Impossible. So, of course, nothing will be the same, right? The question is, how do we define that time and define that change? I've placed it in the locus of a generation that has similarly identified that adults have failed them, have betrayed them on issues of climate, gun control, racial justice, the protection of transgender life on gender justice. These people, you know, 18 to 35, but also much younger who aren't counted amongst the constituents who are being pulled, are the future. Are the future. There is no way the universe they create after experiencing this moment looks like the universe we live in now. It's impossible. It's impossible. And so that's where I see this change coming about. I see it as being generational. 
I see it as being iterative. I see it as also being preceded by a tremendous more amount of pressure and repression than we've experienced so far. And I just encourage folks to continue to take care of one another, to continue in the legacies that we have learned, especially during COVID where folks learn to take care of one another in the failure of government and in government betrayal, especially in the moment of Black uprising where abolition became mainstreamed almost in a matter of weeks to think about what does it mean, right? In the words of Ruth Wilson Gilmore and also Miriam Kaba, this concept of creating life-affirming conditions, life-affirming conditions. And so that's where I'm at on this. And I encourage us all to keep faith and not to lose it. Thank you so much, Nora. I hope you know how much I appreciate you. I'd love to hug you, but I'll send you a virtual hug. Yeah, I'm smiling real hard, so I don't cry. You know, if you smile really hard, you just push back. (laughs) This is a very, you said earlier, you're on the brink of tears. I mean, I cry at any given moment. Mm. I'll be fine. I'll be walking to pick up my daughter from somewhere and I'll just cry. This is just where we're at. This is just where we're at. And I think that that's wonderful because it means we're human still. Love you, Nura. Thank you, Frank. Love you too. That's our show. Mondo Weiss is a nonprofit publication with no paywalls. If you would like to support our work, please go to mondoweiss.net slash donate. Please leave a rating and review to help other listeners find the show. Subscribe to one of our free email newsletters so you can stay up to date on events in Palestine and related politics here in the U.S. and around the world. Finally, if you have any more feedback, send me an email at dave at Thanks for listening. We'll be back soon with a new episode.